Now, most TV programming has you believe that you take about 30 seconds to do your planning and go to the city and get your permits and then it's on your way. There you are, you drag out shovels. But before you do any of that, let's talk to Chad and find out where to start, what you need to do, what the steps are, and he'll give us the answers. Chad, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. I'm, I'm so excited that you're here today with us. Thank you for having me. Great, great, great. So let's start at the very beginning. When you first meet a client and they have their dreams, how do you start explaining the process with them? Sure. So I guess kind of the first step is a sit down meeting. Uh, we'll get together and uh, we have a checklist that we go through uh, pretty sequentially. Uh, certain questions that we ask uh, to make sure that we all have a common understand understanding. And kind of that first step is making sure we understand the project scope. Um, you know, not all of our projects are new construction. We also are involved in remodel projects. And so understanding the scope is pretty critical. Um, and then it's always good to ask general questions as well. Uh, where are you at currently within the process of moving forward? Uh, that's important to know. And then uh, wanting to know whether a client has ever built a home or remodeled before. Is well, also let's talk good. a little bit about budgeting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, traditional traditional builders, when you go to a development, they offer you a package and it's X number of dollars and then the upgrades on top of it. When mm -hmm. you're doing custom homes, tell me how that works financially and how you and the client work together to make sure that everybody's on target. Sure. So one of the first questions uh, that we have to ask is budget. What is the budget for the project? Um, and just kind of a little sideline regarding budget we don't always get the honest answer. <laughs> Sometimes uh, clients will say X amount. Uh, in their own minds, they mean 10% more. Uh, and, and then that comes, comes out later through the course of additional conversation, uh, and sometimes even later in the process of design. Uh, but when we're talking budget, it's super important to be aware of what your target is on the front end. Um, literally, as an architect, uh, we design to the budget. That is, that is one of our greatest responsibilities: is to create a beautiful, attractive, functional design uh, that it, that will be constructed within the budget that is provided by the client. That's critical, and people don't realize what the upgrades cost. So, mm -hmm. how do you how do you keep them on track? Well, so our process uh, involves starting out with an initial design, and we call it a schematic design or a preliminary mm -hmm. design. And in that drawing set, the initial set, uh, it, it is not super detailed. It is not a complete uh, construction drawing that you would submit for a building permit. It, uh, it creates a concept uh, that we can all tangibly understand. Uh, and then we price the concept before we move forward with additional detail. Uh, and when I assist a client in acquiring that pricing, uh, typically we'll get pricing from three different builders uh, and then use that pricing as a basis for moving forward with the design and making selections in uh, for the purpose of finalizing the drawing set. So uh, I'm, I know that not every architect uses that process, but for us, it's been incredibly valuable. Uh, when you get three different estimates from three different builders, now you can feel pretty comfortable uh, that you've covered all of your bases and that you have a, an accurate estimate to move forward with. Does um, that make sense? Yes, it does. But when you get into the details, you're saying this is a schematic. It isn't really specific. Correct. So if the client is expecting, let's say, a metal roof, um, LP, or mm -hmm. specific windows is that that can't be included in your in your initial numbers or is it included in your initial numbers uh, it is along with the preliminary drawings i typically will write a two page narrative that includes specifics related to that project so countertop expectations window expectations siding roofing uh, obviously a metal roof versus a asphalt roof, there's a pretty significant difference. Um, and so being prepared ahead of time and providing that information to the builder uh, allows them to give us a more accurate estimate. Uh, so we kind of provide that narrative as a supplement to the drawings. Um, and that way everybody is putting numbers to the same items, kind of apples to apples. 
And hopefully it allows for those estimates to be more in line with each other. Okay, terrific. Mm -hmm. So then next, land. How do you help people understand how to buy land, where to buy land, and what do they need to know about that? Okay. Yeah. So uh, typically when it comes to land, obviously this is one of the most important components of any project. Uh, and I see it overlooked all the time. Um, when we're talking about property, so we, we have had several potential clients come to us and say, we'd like to move forward with a design. Uh, we don't have the property yet. And instantly we say, hold on, let's, let's just hit the brakes here because it, it really does not make sense to design a building if we don't know what site it will sit on. Um, and so we encourage all of our clients to purchase the property ahead of time. Um, and typically a realtor can assist with that. There are some items that you do want to consider when you're looking for property, uh, may or may not be discussed as you're moving forward in, in looking at options. Uh, and some of those would include sun angles, knowing uh, which direction the sun will rise and fall during various times of the year, because it varies quite a bit uh, in mm -hmm. this part of the country. Right. Uh, knowing where the prevailing winds are coming from, both winter and summer, so that you can block those winter winds and create opportunities for uh, through home ventilation with the summer breeze. Um, and then obviously views, that's a pretty easy one. Most people take that into consideration. Where are your best views, but also what views would you like to either block or prevent? Um, and, uh, and then of course, utilities, what utilities are available at the site? Uh, do you have natural gas? Is it city water and sewer or are those private systems? Uh, and then of course the soil, which again, an item that's often overlooked, but what is the soil of the site? Is there a perk test? If so, what location was approved for the perk, meaning a soil test to allow for a septic system? Um, so those are some of the factors that I think need to be considered when you're considering property. You'd, you'd totally relate to this. I had a client who was approved for like $350,000 and he didn't like anything that I was showing him. So mm -hmm. he called me up really excited. He found a great property, 18 acres, what did I think? It was only 250000 Well, I thought the price was right, mm -hmm. but um, it was 18 miles from any water hookup, which I explained that he had to install his own septic um, mm -hmm. system and drainage and all of that. He had to put in roads. There was no electrical hookup anywhere near. He was so upset. So mm -hmm. what do you do? Uh, how do you treat a client dream when they come to you and they've already purchased a piece of land? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as part of our process before we design anything, we do, uh, we perform what we call property research. Uh, and so all of the components that I mentioned to you, I, I look into and identify those and present them to the client. Uh, occasionally, we have a client who has expressed interest in working with us, but they're not quite ready to move forward with an actual design. Uh, and for that purpose, we have a consultation that we provide in which we research and identify all of those items. Uh, we've also done that for people who are looking at property and exploring the potential of a particular location. Um, but it, it, all of that information is, is available online and, and pretty easy to access if you know what to look for. That's the, that's the issue. And do you find most people have an idea of what they're supposed to be looking for? No, most people <laughs> don't know what to look for. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And hopefully uh, having more conversations like this will allow more people to be aware of that. Absolutely. So um, you get bids from three builders. And when do you get the builder in, involved in the actual process? Uh, well, so initially it's not actually a bid. It's an estimate. Uh, in this first phase when we have the preliminary drawings. Yes. So yes. Uh, we, we always make sure to use the the, the language correctly. They, this is not a final bid, it's an estimate. But uh, typically, in addition to acquiring the estimate, typically we will do that uh, for our clients. Um, and then we also like to have an interview, uh, just an opportunity for the contractor to present their estimate to the client to make okay. sure their uh, personalities align and uh, it, sometimes the client will say, hey, we really liked uh, this particular builder and we'd like to move forward with them when we get the final bid. Um, and then, of course, once we get those estimates, 
uh, modify the drawings, move forward with finalizing the drawings. Uh, at the very end, now we're looking at final bids. Uh, so we might be approaching the same three builders uh, for final bids. It might be one of the three uh, due to the conversations that occurred in reviewing the estimate. Um, and then, of course, uh, by this time, it is it is uh, the purpose is to actually hire and select a general contractor. Uh, and so, once the final bids are received, a contractor is selected, and at this point, the contractor moves forward with acquiring the building permit for the client, as well as moving forward with the schedule, uh, coordinating the project schedule during construction. Great. Um most, you know, most builders don't want to talk to people. They like to build. Mm -hmm. So how do you prepare your clients to work with you on the project and to work with the builder? I mean, you speak builder, they don't. Um, so how do you orient them or how do you educate them on how, how best serves their interest to work with you and the builder? Sure. So first of all, we don't typically um, endorse any particular builder. Uh, we have several that we've worked with uh, that we we would be comfortable recommending uh, or steering towards, and but we also have a handful that we would definitely steer our clients away from. Um, as far as that coordination and conversation moving forward, uh, a lot of people think that uh, an architect designs the plan and then walks away and the builder moves forward with the build. Uh, that's not the way that we work. Um, our process is actually more uh, in line with what is typical of a commercial construction project. And what I mean by, th by that is we are typically involved during construction. Uh, we uh, we call it construction administration, but we uh, are available for questions from either the builder or the homeowner. Uh, we do four to six site visits during construction, typically at strategic points during construction. And I act as if it's my home. I walk around, I look for potential issues, I uh, answer questions, I get to know some of the subcontractors. Um, and keep in mind, I do not work for the builder, I work for the client. And so I'm looking for problems, anticipating issues, and then making recommendations or resolving issues as they come up. That's not really how most architects work, is it? Would you explain what most architects do do? Yeah, so typically when it comes to residential projects, uh, a lot of architects just provide the design and and then move on. Uh, they're typically not always involved during construction. Uh, whereas with commercial projects, uh, it's literally legally required by the state to have a registered professional observe construction. So when a commercial project is complete, I have to sign a form here in Wisconsin stating that it was built the way that I designed it. And I have to observe construction in order to be able to sign that form. Wow. And so, That's a yeah, difference. it is. And so uh, we're kind of bringing that same attitude, mentality, process to residential construction. And I hope to see more architects doing that as well uh, for the purpose of better projects, better completed projects that have fewer issues. Now, mostly you're bu you build mostly high performance homes, correct? Correct. What is the difference between, let's say, a normal, a small builder, not the nationals, because there's a huge difference there, but a small builder, what is the difference between how you work in a high performance home than an average median her score home? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I guess the first thing that really uh, comes to mind is your selections. You're, uh, as, a, as a designer, thinking about what systems you wanna use within the home. And what I mean by that is exterior wall types, uh, roof types, insulation types and locations and quantities. Uh, window types is really important. You're literally creating these openings within your super insulated wall. Uh, it, it's pretty important that that is correctly sealed, flashed, uh, et cetera. Um, and so really it's, it's, it's a mentality shift, but there are just a couple other components that sometimes are not considered uh, when you're thinking about high performance homes. And in my mind, uh, that's particularly pertaining to um, indoor air quality, right? So when you're creating this super tight building, uh, you are now trapping yourself with all of the items that are within that home, including potentially toxic items. 
Uh, more and more people are becoming aware of off-gassing as related to uh, plywood products, paint products, plastic laminates. Uh, many of those have adhesives that off-gas, and when you're in a really tight home, it's important that you ventilate correctly. You're inhaling them, yes. Correct, yep, and many of them are carcinogens, uh, cancer-causing. Uh, however, you can avoid those types of materials. With research, you can find alternative products for similar prices. You don't have to necessarily pay more. Um, and so those are things uh, that, that come to mind right away. That's a really important because most people have the impression that a high performance home is going to cost them maybe one and a half to two times what a, an average home would cost. Mm -hmm. Do you find that your clients are well informed about the high performance or are they depending on you to educate them? Um, very few of the clients that I've worked with are uh, well versed in uh, high performance homes. And so there's definitely an educational element that occurs in, in almost every project. Uh, not everyone is prepared to take that leap uh, and look at a high performance home. Uh, but I am finding more and more people are interested uh, and, and desire to learn more about it. Right. So those people, those people are really, really interested, but they don't, obviously, average people aren't going to have the wealth, the depth of knowledge that you as both having experience as a contractor and now as an architect would have. Do you think yeah. that's pretty much where we are with us? Yeah, there, I mean, there's a ton of information online, but it is difficult to sift through. Um, and a lot of people don't, uh, don't put the time and effort into that. And so working with somebody who does have experience uh, makes a big difference, not just an architect, but a builder as well. Um, you know, working with a knowledgeable builder who has that type of experience really streamlines the entire process. Oh, I think that's super critical to the process. Do you want to talk a little bit about your projects that you've been working on? Sure. Yep. So I have a project right now uh, that's currently under construction. Uh, it's just east of Eau Claire on Lake Eau Claire. Um, and it is a, a super energy efficient home. This home uh, is constructed of insulated concrete forms. Okay, so um, here you are on site. Mm -hmm. Yep, so this was last fall when we started the foundation, uh, put in the footings and moving forward with the basement component. So we worked with Logix, L-O-G-I-X, insulated concrete forms on this project. Uh, and worked from the footing uh, all the way up the wall to our roof. And so these are my, <laughs> that's uh, kind of a, a interesting group of people, mostly my friends, my dad and my sons. Uh, so we actually did the work for this initial stage here, setting that foundation. But as you can see, there's an insulated concrete form. Uh, it has two and three quarter inches of foam on both sides and then uh, plastic ties that connect each end. And then we actually added an additional uh, layer of foam, that four inch insert, the gray insert that was in the previous photo. Uh, and so we end up with six and three quarter inches of foam at the exterior and two and three quarter inches of foam at the interior and then fill the remaining area, which is about eight inches with uh, rebar for reinforcement and then also concrete. Okay. Uh, and so it ends up being a really tight home um, in terms of efficiency. Uh, well, with that much foam in the exterior wall, it, it ends up being pretty tight. Uh, and then, of course, because we're working with an unusual wall system, uh, I had never seen this wall type done before. Um, I had heard about it, and uh, it, I think you have done an interview with the homeowner of uh, who had done a similar wall type in Afton. Uh, Minnesota. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so I'd heard about uh, what he had attempted to do. And uh, I, unfortunately, I didn't know him. Uh, and so I just kind of started down this road, uh, figuring it out as I went. And, but you got uh, the builder who knows who did it. That yeah. So I wound up actually uh, bringing a, a, a general contractor on board. His name is Jay Roker with Bluff City Builders. He's out of Minnesota. Uh, and he's actually the gentleman who built that Afton home. And so it was it was phenomenal to bring him in as part of the team uh, to figure out some of these details because there are some unusual details in this type of construction. So uh, it was great to bring in his experience and uh, definitely sped up the process a bit as well. 
uh, as opposed to attempting to do it all myself. Well, Logix does have trainings uh, online, and I don't know if they did a couple of years ago. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was mentioning Logix or ICFs, as they're called, to a builder who does traditional building. He said, no, no, my crew won't touch it. And I go, mm -hmm. in a couple of years, you're not going to have a lot of options. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. So uh, in 2004, I designed Logix Homes pretty extensively in Western Minnesota. And it was it was fairly common. Uh, a lot of people had heard of it. it was, uh, more, more and more contractors were building with it. I moved to Eau Claire, Wisconsin in 2010, uh, and nobody had heard of it. Nobody was familiar. Uh, even when I started this project last fall, I couldn't find a builder to, uh, to install it. So that's why I did it myself. Okay. Um, literally, I, I scoured the city and couldn't find anybody who would do it. So you should call me. I know too. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, thankfully, uh, after getting into it a ways, I met Jay, who has a ton of experience, and so he he uh, he he's been helping us out along the way. I did. I built a similar home, an ICF home, in two thousand six in Minnesota. Uh, just did it myself, but I didn't have those inserts, so it was a little bit different. It was easier to build that one, and it was a single story. This this home that we just looked at is uh, multi-story, so it's a little bit different uh, when you're going that high, trying to pump concrete, stack forms. There's a lot of logistical items that need to be considered. Oh, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was talking to the Logix rep here, and he's working with a commercial property that wants 18-foot ceilings. So oh. that mm -hmm. adds another dynamic to making it all work. But I yeah. think, would you explain what is the advantage of using the concrete forms? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, right now, wood is extremely expensive. Concrete has increased slightly, uh, but nowhere near the the extent of, of increase relative to wood. Uh, but generally speaking, you're talking about a concrete wall rather than a wood wall, right? And so it is literally rated as a two hour firewall. It can burn for two hours and still maintain its structural integrity. Uh, so that's a key feature. It can also withstand pretty significant wind loads. Um, you know, if, if you had a tornado type event, uh, my home is reinforced in such a way by the way, that home that I'm building is is for our family, uh, but the, it's built in such a way that it'll withstand 300 mile an hour winds. Uh, and so, rather than having a safe room within the home, the entire home is essentially a safe room. Uh, and then, of course, there are other components that uh, the energy efficiency is definitely a component um, that needs to be considered. Uh, it does affect the thickness of your walls, uh, so that. That, that is something that sometimes people are surprised by when they visit the site. Uh, you know, it's a, our, our wall is 17 and a half inches thick. Yeah, That's a pretty right. thick wall. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and of course, when you think about uh, water intrusion, uh, you know, when you have any type of water intrusion type issue, uh, this uh, ICFs are a product that will not rot or mold. The only thing that deteriorates the foam uh, is, is actually UV and sunlight. Uh, so you do want to protect it from being exposed to sunlight, outdoor elements over an extended period of time. But uh, overall, it's uh, generally a healthier product, I think. It's, well, actually, the the foam wouldn't be exposed to sunlight because you, you sheathe it with a siding, a normal siding, correct? Correct. Yep. It's typically okay. exposed during construction. Uh, oh, and you okay. will see it'll yellow a, a little bit. Uh, but, you know, in a reasonable amount of time within a year as it's covered with uh, exterior finished materials, um, you, you no longer have to worry about that. But I would say those are some of the benefits that I think are, are key features and definitely worthy of considering. Wonderful. Th thank you so much, Chad. Um, can you tell us where and how people can be in touch with you if they're interested in building? Sure. Yep. I think the best way to connect uh, with us is to visit our website, which is designeauclair.com. Eau Claire is an unusual word if you haven't heard it before. Uh, <laughs> it's E-A-U-C-L-A-I-R-E. -E. So designeauclair.com. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching. Thank you for Chad. Um, lots of questions. 
Of course, we would love to hear your questions as well. And if we can't get back to you immediately, by next week we will. And if you don't know how to get in touch with Chad, call me and I will put you in touch with him. So please stay tuned uh, for next week. We will have another builder interview and y'all should be really excited as well. Thanks much and hope to talk to you soon. Bye.